wavelength long, right? So, um, continue. Give me a nice little pop-up window there. Can everybody, everybody can see this drawing, right? Right. Um, so we have this wire, it's a half wavelength long, and that's all it really takes to be a dipole, right? Um, now, we're typically used to, if, if as hams, we're gonna make a dipole, we're probably gonna feed this thing in the center. Um, and some of us probably know, but some of us might even not know why in the world we feed it in the center, right? Um, so our radios have a characteristic and output impedance of 50 ohms, um, you know, and anywhere on this wire, um, the, the, uh, impedance is going to be different. And here's why, um, current has its distribution, the wave, this half a wave will dis distribute itself. It's current characteristic will distribute itself like this, right? So this this is half of our wave. Um, and the reason it does this is because here in the center, a lot of current can pass into the antenna because you still have the whole antenna in both directions, right? Um, but as you get closer to the ends, less and less current could pass because there's less and less in, a, a current out in front of it, right? Um, now your voltage will raise at the edge, right? So your voltage will, part of your uh, component to your wave will look more like this, right? So as your current drops near the edge of the antenna, the voltage will be higher. And in, in turn, when this current is very low, so very little current can flow at the very edge of the antenna, the impedance is very high, right? Because very little current can flow. It's not to mean there's not energy there. It's just current can't flow because it's out at the end of the antenna, okay? So at the center of the antenna, where a lot of current can flow, the impedance is lower, right? And in this situation where we have a dipole, um, you know, just full on breaking this, this thing here in the center, you know, and, and tying our, our coax to one side or the other um, will give us an impedance somewhere in the mid seventies, which is pretty close to, um, to what we need, you know, to run a 50 ohm radio. Um, now there are things that you can do. You can you can lower the ends and you you can you know shorten them and lengthen them a little bit to to tweak that impedance a little bit. But a perfectly um, cut piece of half wave antenna, you know, will give you a an impedance close to seventy five ohms. So a very low impedance here in the middle, and a very high impedance at the ends. So when we look at a J match antenna, and let me clear this out of here. Um, you know, a J-match antenna has this J at the bottom, and then it has this, this half wave section segment here, right? And this is, this is basically, this top part is a half wave dipole. But we're not feeding it in the center like we do our, our regular dipoles um, because you know, that's inconvenient, you know? Um, you need to be able to use a, a vertical antenna for, for an FM, you know, radio that you're, you're talking to other repeaters <laughs> like that. Typically, omnidirectional antennas are well more easily built in the vertical plane, right? Not in the horizontal plane. So um, just do their patterns. Well, it's, it's really inconvenient to use a dipole, you know, in a, in a vertical orientation because you have to get this coax to the center of it. So here we have the J pole, right? Um, so the, the magic, the magic really happens, um, at the bottom of the J pole. Whoa, I did not intend for that to be that big what in the world. Happened? Um, where we have this J match. So what is this J match? Right. And we, we connect our, our coax, you know, maybe somewhere near the bottom, but it, it is kind of a mystery in how this works. Right. So. The J match is a quarter wave section of feed line, right? It's, it's parallel feed line um, and it's tied together at the bottom here. So what happens, you know, if you have a piece of feed line that's tied, that's shorted at the bottom, wherever you're shorted, the impedance is gonna be very low or, or near zero, right? And, and wherever you're open up at the top here, your impedance is going to be very high 
or, or in the like thousands of ohms, right? Um, many thousands of ohms. Some people claim near infinity, but it's not. It's, it's, it's very high impedance, but not, not infinity. So, so now we have this, and, and the reason for this is our current distribution on the quarter wave, right? Just like on our dipole is like this. So down here, we have a lot of current can flow, right? Because infinite current can flow through a short, right? And almost no current can flow through an open, right? So that's how this, this quarter wave section works. Now, somewhere between zero ohms of impedance, which is a complete short, and thousands and thousands of ohms are a very high impedance, you know, we have different levels of impedance. Well, at some point, and it happens to be a few inches up from the bottom of the J-pole, the impedance is around 50 ohms. Now, up here where our impedance is thousands of ohms, this matches up really good with our half wave antenna whose current is who, whose impedance is also very high here at the end. So we can take this J and we can match it up to this half wave dipole who has a very high impedance on the end. This J has a very high impedance on the end. Now we get a match right here, right? So that's, that's how this J matching section works in our, uh, in, in the antennas. Now, um, that's just a single band um, J pole antenna. Um, I'm not going to get into the science of how a Slim Jim works because the Slim Jim works on a principle of a folded dipole, which adds another folded over element. It's supposed to add gain and it's supposed to add bandwidth um, because it makes the element thicker or seem thicker to itself. And that's the actual antennas that I build. But um, I don't know that I fully understand exactly how much gain this adds. I thought I did for a lot of years, but we're going to do some testing here real soon. I'm going to do some videos and put them on the web. But um, so basically, um, the only other thing that is a trick in the antennas that we make is the stubs that cut this out at, um, that cut a uh, half wave UHF element out of this half wave VHF element up at the top. We put the stub in there. The stub works the same way as this uh, quarter wave element, except it's turned upside down, right? The stub is a piece of coax. That's a, I don't draw very good coax, but that's shorted on the top and open on the bottom, right? So you're short, you have a very low impedance. Again, you have a very high impedance because your current doesn't flow here at the bottom. So if this quarter wave stub is cut to, you know, uh, 465 or whatever, um, or not for, sorry, 445, yeah. the center of the UHF band, um, it will act as a really high impedance at the end of where we put the trap, you know, in our, in our antenna. So let me, let me clear this out and draw this a little bit better here. So now we have our matching section, we have our top, and then up here we have our traps that are open on the bottom. And a lot of people ask me why I put traps on both sides. Um, it's just easier to build. I don't know that you, you probably don't actually need the second trap, but um, it's very difficult to cut one half of this antenna out and try and leave a conductor over here and then add a stub in here. And it was just simpler to build a top section and a bottom section, throw a stub on either side and call it a day. Uh, Cause coax is cheap and they're not very long, but um, so that's it. That's, that's basically how, um, a J match antenna works. And I don't know, I think it's really interesting, you know, thinking about AC current distribution on wires and things like that. I've, I've always found that to be one of the more fascinating things and why I'm more interested in antennas than anything else in radio almost because, um, they're really the most important part of your setup and, and, and understanding how they work will also under, help you understand how to modify them and make um, better or different antennas with different patterns and things like that. So, so interesting, uh, interesting kind of thing. If, if, I don't know, Paul, do you want to do questions? Um, yeah, let's. If, if people want to talk about the, the J match antenna and what I've discussed so far before I get into the field day stuff. 
Yeah, if you've got antenna questions, uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and feel free to ask. I must have done a really good job explaining that. Do you have a website? I do. Um, I have a couple of websites, actually. Um, I have uh, nitax.com. It's like my personal website. And then uh, I have nitaxlabs.com, which is my web store where I sell the antennas that I make. Um, so, yeah, a couple different places here and i'm i'm working on getting better at updating all of that stuff too so i mean we keep the web store updated pretty good but i'm i'm a little bit laxed at updating nitax.com but uh hopefully as i start to do these youtube videos here there will be uh be more uh more going up on there hey joe could you tell me um a little bit more about how those stubs fit into the overall scheme all right so we don't want to make an antenna work properly at UHF. And what we're basically doing mm -hmm. is we're saying, let's, let's cut the antenna off right here. Um, so we have this, we have this matching section down here. That's a, that's a quarter wave at, I think, at, you're, uh, drawing, I think you're drawing, but we see you. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me, let me fade back to the drawing. Um, so we have this quarter wave section down here at, at, at VHF, right, which is also going to be harmonically related at UHF. So the, the value of that is that this actually works pretty much the same way. There's probably some inefficiency because it's, it's multiple quarter waves at UHF and single quarter wave at VHF, right? So, so considering that our matching section still offers us <clears throat> the ability to um, match in a, a, a UHF or a VHF signal. Um, what we wanna do is we wanna be able to cut this um, from an RF standpoint, we wanna be able to cut this conductor here down to a half wave um, at UHF. And the way we do that is with the trap. And the trap works the same way as the matching section does, only it's turned upside down, right? It's shorted at the top and it's open at the bottom. So it's a, it's a quarter wave at whatever our, our center UHF frequency that we're trying to accomplish is. And there's nothing revolutionary here. People have been, have been using um, quarter wave um, resonators as, as notch filters and things for years, right? But, but basically, when you have an exact quarter wave at UHF and, and one side is shorted, right? So a quarter wave, a quarter wave, whatever, if it's a quarter wave piece of wire, the wave is going to hit it like this. This is the current portion of the wave, right? Or I. Um, so at one end, the current will be very low. And at the other end, the current will be very high. Um, wherever the current is very low, your impedance will be very high, which means that the AC signal will be impede impeded from, from entering that, um, that um, piece of wire or whatever it is. And then at the other end where the, where the impedance is low, a lot of current can, can flow. So the way we do that is we, we tie, we short one end of this trap, right? Which makes this the, the low impedance end, right? Um, at the top, right? Because much current can travel through a short, right? Almost infinite amounts of current minus whatever, you know, the resistance is in the material. Um, so that's our low impedance end. Well, since this is a quarter wave and we force this end to be low impedance, the other wave has to be high impedance. It doesn't have a choice, right? Um, because that's just how a quarter wave of, of material at a certain frequency works. So this is our, our, our high impedance end right down here where very little energy can flow into or past this point, right? So basically what we're doing is we're saying, okay, UHF wave, stop flowing right here because I have a lot of impedance at UHF. So now we have this half wave radiator at UHF and we stop it from being longer by impeding it from moving moving farther up, but with the quarter wave stub. Does that does that make sense? I just kind of hard to explain, but um, 
What happens at VHF? Like so at VHF, you... because this doesn't resonate, right? A quarter wave at UHF does not resonate at VHF. The VHF doesn't even see it. The wave just goes right on up um, because there's no impedance here, right? Right, a VHF wave might, might cross this thing like this. You know, you, it doesn't even, it's not, it's current isn't high or low at either end because it's not the right length. See, it all, the, the whole trick is, you know, having the right length of materials, you know, and, and there's a lot more involved in just, well, this is a half wave long and this is a quarter wave long because there's, there's other things to consider like the velocity factor, you know, coax, um, the, the wave will travel through the cable, you know, at a certain speed, um, slower than the speed of light. So you have to figure that out, you know what I mean? To get the actual length of this, you know, like RG58 is somewhere in like the, the mid 60s percent, right? So, you know, you'd have to do that, that math to figure out how long to make this stub, but you know, yeah, VHF, it doesn't even see the stub. The wave just goes right on through. So the VHF wave will, will represent itself in the entire half wave of, of cable here. So that's basically what's happening. Is that, does that clear it up? You know, and when you're talking about the, the coax stubs and stuff, I pulled mine out. I never noticed that that little section there is actually coax cut in. Yeah. I just yeah. assumed that was the twin lead all the way through. I'm looking, going, son of a gun. It's not. See, I, this, that was sneaky. Now I've given my secrets away. <laughs> it's done exceptionally well. You can't really tell. Magic sauce. <laughs> hey, Joe. Yeah. You put on a, a ferrite choke on, on the antenna. Do you use a special mix for that? Um, it's not a special mix. Um, specifically, it's, it happens to be a ferrite that I could get for a really good price that's supposed to have properties up to 500 megahertz. Um, now, it's, it's just a, it's just a run of the mill ferrite choke um, that's used there. Now, I'm not even 100% sure how effective that ferrite choke is. You know, we started doing this years upon years ago. And, you know, to, to get what you could get with a with loops of 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 cable you might have to have four or five of those things in a row but you know that that would make the antenna very inconvenient i don't know that i've ever ran into a problem um as far as that ferrite goes you know um i could probably even leave it off and the antenna would work just the same but i figure it does help tamp down some of the uh stray currents that might want to try and run back down the coax shield and that's really what it's for um more than anything comment for joe yep uh, i have one of these on my roof uh it's, it's not a two-story roof it's a story and a half roof okay and uh i can reach from uh, mishawaka to schomburg with full quieting that's good yeah i, th I thought it was good so one of the one of the things that I've never actually been able to nail down, and years ago I almost I got an opportunity to take these antennas to an anechoic chamber, but it fell through, um, is really measuring the gain. Um, there's lots of if you go on the internet and start looking up J match antennas, there are a lot of different opinions amongst hams as as to what the gain of these antennas are. Um, there are those that will tell you they're they have negative gain, which I'm not even sure how that's possible, but because that just sounds ridiculous to me, um, and and because it's a dipole, right? You would think that it has at least 2.16 dBs of gain, which is the dipole gain, right? Um, and there are people out there that think these things have six or seven dB dBi of gain, which I don't actually think is is realistic. Now. I've modeled these antennas on NEC and depending on where you put them above real ground, the gain moves around quite a bit. So one of the things that I'm going to do here soon in the future is as the weather gets a little bit better outside and a more regular basis is uh, I have an idea for a test that I'm going to set up where I set up a 
an instrument that will transmit at a given signal on one end of my yard and, and then an instrument that will receive and measure that signal in a very granular way so that I can compare this antenna against different things. And, you know, I intend to uh, compare it against like a quarter wave antenna. I intend to uh, compare it against a dipole and, and possibly a few other antennas. But I, I'm really curious myself to how much gain because they seem to work really well. And I use, you know, I use them myself profusely. And I had one hanging on my tower and that was just off the side. So it was probably about 40 feet off the ground. I'm in, you know, Boone Grove area here outside of Hebron. And could, and I used to use that antenna to, to get into the, uh, or to listen to the, um, back when it was still alive, the, I'm trying to remember, it was, it was Cars, Kanky, Illinois, Amateur Radio Society, maybe, it had a packet uh, beacon that would beacon um, HF uh, spotting. I used that for years to listen to that HF spotting, and that thing worked great. And, and that was, you know, 70, 80 miles away. So, yeah. Wow. I don't know. They're decent antennas, you know. Well, they're, I they're can, not magic, but. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can testify. Usually my wife and I try to go to Las Vegas every year because we like it there, except that I suck at playing games. So while my wife is downstairs, usually winning us some money, I, yeah. I this is a, the uh, suction cup. I stick that in the top of our window and I hang that antenna and I work all the Vegas area repeaters. And I got to tell you, all the uh, windows in most of the, the big hotels, the casinos there are all have uh, metalized solar film on them to keep the heat down. And I get out just fine through, you know, I, I can hit in Henderson, which is like 30 some miles away um, with a handheld inside that metalized film window inside the hotel. So they do their job. Do you think that's, we'll get our audio up. I think so. Matt, Matt thinks he's figured out how to make the audio work if you want to watch my stupid video. Let's watch the stupid video. All right, so what do I got to do? Change this to same system. system. And then bring this up here. Oh, where's that video fun? Do we get to rate it at the end to say how stupid it was? You hear anything? No. All right. Well, okay. So what we can do is at the end, um, and Tavis has suggested this too. At the end, we'll do a screen share. You just do a screen share of your, your video window and make sure that you check, um, check share, uh, uh, share system audio and we'll play it that way. So. All right. So go on to the field day stuff and then we'll do So let's, um, so at field day, um, <laughs> you're going to get a few assets uh, that we're going to borrow from EMA. Go back to uh, your mic. Am I not on my mic? You are not. Better? There we go. Not right. better. Not, I'm not very good at live, so videos I can do, because if I mess up, I can do it over again. Yeah. <laughs> Live is a pain in the butt. Um, so anyway, um, we got a few assets that we're going to use uh, this year that we're going to get from EMA. I don't know if any of you guys were out at the last uh, field day that we did at Kevin's Tower, um, but this is a picture from that field day of the crank up tower antenna that we borrowed from EMA with my uh, my beam on it. So we're going to get this uh, back out again this year. And... Um, hopefully have some some fun with that so uh so we got the tower um that we're gonna get with the beam and i think I, all i had was the beam on it i i think i got a, a six meter antenna i could get on the top of that bad boy too so we can get um god i'm trying to remember what that beam does it does like 10 15 20 30 and 40 uh meters um 40 is just a rotatable dipole but um it works pretty decent and i've so, got a i've got a wire antenna too i believe will cover 80 we've got yeah we've got plenty of wire antennas you guys can hang your antennas up i'll have my inflatable tower out there and my masts and stuff so if we need any support structures we'll be able to come up with something 
but uh, there was a nice picture of that antenna at night when we were working out there. The other thing we're going to borrow is their, um, how many thousand, uh, how many watts is that? 25K. Is that a 25K? Yeah. It's a 25K diesel generator. That's enough. Um, it's very quiet. Um, it'll give us plenty of power. If we want to run amplifiers or whatever, we don't have to worry about it. We'll have all the power we need. Um, so um, they just asked that we put some fuel back in it. And I don't think that should be a problem, but uh, yeah, it's a pretty nice, nice unit there. It's got a big, you, you see that 50 amp plug on there. Um, then there's a cable that comes out to what they call like a squid that has a bunch of outlets on it. So we'll be able to run that into our tent and pretty much get all the power we need. Um, there's another, another picture of the tower trailer collapsed. Um, I think that may be all I have for photos. Um, the other thing that we have that um, the EMA gave to me because they were cleaning out is two, what are they, 10, 10 by 20 white um, shelter tents that we're going to put together. So we'll have like a 20 by 20 tent um, to get in and set all our gear up in. Cool. Um, so it should be um, a reasonably decent field day this year uh and um i don't know hopefully uh we get a lot of people out there because you know i'd like to man i've been cooped up in this house <laughs> and doing nothing but work for this whole pandemic here and really i'm it's gonna be awesome <laughs> yeah i i am hoping that you're right um i i just what i really want to get is i want people out there who want to come and work radios, whether you want to set up your own radio or you want to work the stations that we set up, I don't care. Uh, we'll make it happen one way or another. I got some new stuff for my station. Uh, I got a Heil microphone and a boom, and I'm going to set up a really nice station there. People want to play with that. I'm going to bring um, 3, Matt's got a new radio that he's going to bring out there to play with. If you guys want to bring your radios out and try them out in the field, if you want to set up antennas, I want to be there to work with people, still doing the but I'd really like to see us on the air as close to the whole time as we can be. Now, I don't know if people want to stay up to the wee hours of the night, but you know, um, the more we can be on the air, the better, um, make yep. a good showing of it. So, um, I'll, I'll work on, we should work on a, a, some sort of press release we can get out soon to the Laporte, Michigan city. And well, the, the post trib and that those are, they say they're Valpo papers, but they really like to think that they're Chicago. So huh. we'll, we'll hopefully we can get notice in there at least. It'd be nice to uh, get some press out to the public. Do we know, is there any, yeah, I got us listed on the, uh, I got us listed on the ARL's field day finder as well. As well. Yeah, Fort yeah. County did put it into their newsletter this month. Cool. Do we have any participation from the Laporte Club? This I think so. Sounds like yes. You think that the Laporte and Michigan City clubs are going to, both going to be there? Hmm? What's up? All right, bring a, so, birth, bring a birthday cake. It's my 80th birthday. Oh boy. Yeah. And yeah. Joe and I, we usually have a little grill out there if people want to bring food. Um, I got to talk to Danny still and see if we're doing breakfast in the morning or what the plan is out there exactly. But we kind of need to round table that a little bit because in the past, the clubs have gotten together and put some money towards um, meals and then, you know, grilled out a nice lunch and breakfast. Um, breakfast on sunday and then kind of lunch dinner saturday um i don't know if you guys want to do something like that i'd be i'd be all for helping grill out whatever i know matt likes to grill so um yeah we should work that out definitely yeah. zippy was always the grill master well zippy might want to grill yeah i don't know whoever i'm i'm not uh i'm not picky so all right so one more time you want to see if we can do this video <laughs> what do we got to do to share um, my... hang on i've, I've got to make you uh i've got to make you co-host okay. um 
So to do that, I got to take the spotlight off. And then I've got to go back here and make you co-host, make co-host. You now have the rights to share video, uh, share, yeah, share a screen and make sure you check the little box that says. Uh, yeah, um, I can share sound at the bottom. Yeah, there you go. Optimize for video clip. You don't have to do that. All right, let's see if you can see it. Superman. <laughs> hey, so I see 20, 20, 20, 19, Or no, it's 2001. There you go. So there's my video. <laughs> <laughs> we were playing around and I always wanted to set something to that song. And when I found out that that song actually became public domain in 2015. Oh, really? So anybody can use it for anything now. Yeah, Wagner's been dead for a while. Couldn't help myself. <laughs> but all righty. Well, uh, hopefully it was a decent presentation. I, like I said I was originally fixed on doing that field day one with the setting up those military masks but since so many people watched it already <laughs> you should have held that one back yeah probably well thank you thank you joe and uh was very good i'm working on uh i'm working on a few other people i don't have anybody lined up yet but uh and in the meantime um if i find something at least uh really interesting enough online that we can share I'll set up another meeting in a couple of weeks. Otherwise, we'll just uh, we'll just uh, do something for our regular June meeting. Hey, I have a question. Yeah, um, are we are we going to do anything with any youth groups for the field day? Try to get any scouts out there or anything like that? I had one. I've got one group that I've invited. Um, there was supposed to be a jamboree up at Sunset uh, Hill last year that did not happen because of COVID. So I am working to see if we can get some of those kids out there who were supposed to be at that. Cool. Sounds good. I got a question for Joe. That was, that was Matt, by the way, for those of you that can't see him. We can also, um, we might also want to check with a couple of the area schools in the, you know, STEM program, see if there's anybody who'd be interested in coming out. Somebody had a question. Joe, I got a question. Sure. Uh, can your antenna your uh, uh, your antenna be uh, used in a vertical or a horizontal position? So, I mean, there's no physical reason why you couldn't use it in a horizontal position, but I'm not sure that you'd be better off than using a dipole. And frankly, if I wanted to set up an omnidirectional horizontal antenna, um, I would want to build like a loop because I feel like you'd get a better pattern. Um, I, I can't even fathom in my mind what the pattern would look like off of the, the Slim Jim. You know, not truly understanding um, the ground interaction with that antenna. Um, but yeah, you could turn it sideways and some people have done it. Customers have done it and said it works just fine. Um, so there's no reason why you can't. Uh, it is optimized 
you know, tuning wise for like 146.52, which is kind of higher up in the band, not the lower area of the band where, you know, you typically do sideband, but it, the, the standing wave is still really good all the way down to 144. So there's no reason why you couldn't do it. Is this not a, uh, two, uh, a dual band uh, antenna? Which, which antenna is that? Your, uh, the one you, uh, the one you showed us. So the last one that I drew, um, let's see if I can get it back up there, is the dual band antenna. Where is it at? You originally started out with a single band. This one here? you made a dual band. Yeah, after I added these stubs, anyone that has the stubs on it are the dual band antennas. Mine's a dual. Good. I got you. I have, I have both have of them. Yeah, they'll have the coax stubs in there. And at VHF, there's really no difference. Um, at UHF, it does trap out the element. Um, a lot of people will make J-poles that, uh, that don't have a trap. And they'll claim that they work well at... And I mean, a half-wave VHF uh, element will resonate on UHF's third harmonic, but it's not... I don't think it's as efficient as, as a half wave antenna because you don't, it doesn't quite tune right. I have found, and I've bought some of the competitors antennas who just sell a J pole and claim that it works on UHF. And it's not really lined up all that well with the UHF band. So we decided to go this route, make it more pure. Okay. And I just want to add, uh, there was a lot of anticipation for your, uh, for your video tonight and uh thanks for doing that <laughs> the video that i put on youtube or this one this the one. one you did the one you did tonight <laughs> well hopefully it was uh it was decent um like i said we put a lot of time into that video and then almost everybody watched it so <laughs> okay that's what you wanted wasn't it well yep. yeah i don't know you the next put, time when i come up with a video up too soon yeah, when I come up with a video next time for the club, I'll, I'll play it for the club first and then play There you it. go. No. Um, yeah, and this uh, this Zoom thing is, is very convenient for clubs, too. You put some stuff together, you might get some other clubs ask you to do things. Um, since since I, you know, remember, I, I gave the, the, the first run through of the Newsline presentation for you guys. Um, I've done two of those so far don's done three neil's done two and i've got two more scheduled in the next two weeks so uh, it's getting the word out clubs around the country are starting to hear that they can get one of the newsline nerds to come in and talk about it so uh the internet has become a, a, a very easy way for us to get people to come in and speak without having to pay for them to come here good so all righty, everybody. If anybody else has anything else, watch me pizza. I have one uh, one question for Joe, not antenna related. Okay, have... go ahead. Joey. Pay attention, Joe. Uh huh. <laughs> uh, KD nine NSC has come into possession of a uh, Kenwood TKR seven twenty repeater, and I believe the K nine PC repeater is a TKR seven twenty. Is that right? Well, K nine PC owns a TKR 720. It's somewhere in either the closet over there or the closet over there. The, wait, no, 720. Yes, the one on the air is a 720. We also have a 740. There's another Kenwood that doesn't work right. But anyway, yes, the one up there is a 720. I'm sorry. Okay. Do you have the, uh, the means of programming the uh, 720? Oh boy! You want to see? You want to see that thing? Where is it at? I don't know. I think it's in the back. Hang on. Okay. You need this magical guy, huh? That's the guy, yeah. Oh boy, look. I always forget where I put that service manual too until I open this box up. 
probably been a while since you opened that box. Yeah. Look at that thing in all its goodness and glory. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you're the guy we got to talk to. We so, can get a uh, program for you. Cool. Cool. Uh, Tom Tittle, who owns Aqualand Communications over in Ogden Dunes, he was uh, cleaning out his shop and, and found the TKR 720 and, and gifted it to Tavis to play with. So it happens, yeah. it happens to be programmed, I think, for the same frequency as the K9 PC repeater. So I can't oh, believe it that way. <laughs> so we got to do some reprogramming. Yeah, we can get it on a frequency for you. Cool. No problem. Awesome. Sounds good. Hey, Joe, if I wanted to buy one of your antennas, is it only available through eBay? Um, well, no, the n9taxlabs.com website that Matt shared in the chat. Um, and I'll probably bring some out to field day too. If, if people in the club want antennas, just shoot me some messages and we'll, uh, we'll get them all made up for field day. We could do that too. How, how do I message you? Message me? Um, go to my n9taxlabs.com and on the very front page is a contact us form. Probably the fastest way. Or my email is joe at n9tax.com. Thanks, Joe. Yep. <clears throat> All righty. Anybody have anything else? So we're not going out oh, to dinner. Very nice Hi, presentation, Joe. Huh? Very nice presentation. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. The window and show the star of the my wife helps build the antennas matt's trying to drag her over here into the video right now and she's fighting with all her will oh brandy get over there get over there get over here brandy gonna get, it doesn't bite she's hiding over there <laughs> there Very good. i'm not anymore there she is True. This is my wife, Brandy. Hi, Brandy. Some of you know her. She used yeah. to go to club meetings. Hi, well, everybody knows her. Do you think we all used to go to club meetings? <laughs> Find the receipt in the Third bag. Off. The bags are right around there. Yeah. And um, just go. All righty. The receipt are probably over by the front door. Who's there? Okay. Anybody? Uh, anybody have anything else? One question, Paul. When All right. We do, when we do get to have meetings again, where are we having them then? That I don't know. The uh, Matt, what it, you were saying that uh, there might be a problem. They've totally re you can speak to the, the yeah, EMA the, building. The county still has a no meeting policy in place. No, I mean when that that's lifted. That no, well, the other yeah. thing about the problem with that room is that they like built it into a permanent EOC. They put phones and all kinds of stuff in there. Now he doesn't want people meeting in there to well, with all the equipment out all the time. So I don't know where that's going to go yet. But um, we have talked a little bit with um, the Elks Club. It's which is very near the library in downtown valpo in fact i might be out there tomorrow maybe i'll mention to them about using the room for ve testing until the uh library lets up a little bit okay they have a banquet hall that they i know there's a couple of clubs that they're letting use that banquet hall for nothing right now um that's a pretty nice building i mean it's not doesn't have the av setup that they have at the uh we just have at the EOC, it but later in the day at three. Yeah, it's it's about three blocks west of the library. It's on, it's on the, uh, 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 is that Jefferson? Directly no. behind the city government complex. Yeah. Okay, no, it's on. Yeah, on on the uh, Jefferson. Take off. <coughs> yeah, Napoleon or oh. whatever that other road is there. I wonder what's going on in the old Hirschman Hall for the Valpo Tech. We used to use that building about forty-five years ago. Is is that one still? Is that the one that's still standing along? It's still standing. I don't they, know if uh, there's anything in it. The there's a couple of uh, well, I know Chicago Street Theater rents part of the upstairs for like a rehearsal studio, 
which we haven't been into for a while because I don't know that it's been open. And I think there's a couple other, there are one or two businesses, I think, that rent some space in it. I don't know about the rest of it. Yeah, I mean, we do have a history with that, with that, uh, that property. We met on the ground floor. Yeah. On the ground floor 45 years ago. Yeah, I don't know if that's on TV. I don't know if that's still uh, open to the public or not. That's something to check too. But yeah, right now the Elks Club is, is a, because there's a nice parking lot right next to it. Can't use that. Is that for the bank? Or that that, uh, that that building? Yes, it, one's the city's lot and the yeah, other one's Centier's lot. The one next door to, uh, the one side is Centier's, the other side is the city. But there's the lot that's like across the street, kind of kitty corner. That's the one where we always park. That's true. The one right across the street. Yeah, the one right next to it, you're right, is Centier. The one right yeah. across the street is the city lot. <laughs> But you can park in that one. The other one that's like directly next to it on the opposite side of Centier is like a private lot. You got to have like a parking pass for, I don't yeah. know, kind of a pain, but, but the one across the way, there's usually plenty of spots. Yeah. There's, there's a, a decent amount of street parking there too. Mm -hmm. I just don't know about getting in there early in the morning. I'll have to talk to them. All right. Because I do know I, we had uh, one guy emailing about, because uh, I know we're going to have at least one person show up on the 22nd. Uh, somebody emailed today about uh, exams. Because hmm. email. next week, well, he emailed the, I think he emailed the mailing list. Oh, okay. I'll forward it to you. Yeah. Um, because he was asking if it was going to be next week, because next week traditionally would be our standard Saturday. But um, I <laughs> and I actually forgot that I had reserved the room last Saturday. And uh, I did not get a reminder email from the library, which and, and we haven't done this for so long. My brain wasn't in that mode. Yeah. So I called the library and apologized profusely. I said, please do not put a black mark on my permanent record. And uh, they let me reserve the room for the 22nd. So. so they're only doing it a month in advance now? No, I, we can go further ahead. I just didn't know what we we're going to do with June yet. If we're going to, if we're going to do it on field day, we, that might be the only one. I'll sure. check and I'll check and see about July. I gotta check and see what's going on with mailing the, mailing it in too. Yeah, because in, in between the last time we did exams and now, the library completely ripped out their registration system and put in a brand new one. So hmm. I had to go through the whole registration process again, and it, it's in my name now. It's they no longer have group registrations. It's kind of a pain. That's the third time since I've been reserving rooms for exams that they've completely ripped out their registration system and changed it with something else. I got a email from Maria. I'll have to go read it again and see about how they want it mailed out. Oh, the, the league? Yeah. Okay. I'm talking about uh, e, uh, doing it by email or email. So I'd have to scan all the forms and everything. Oh. Okay. So we don't know yet. Because they've been having problems with the mail getting there on time. Yeah. I know uh, a friend of mine mailed me something from the south side of Chicago. It took three days to get over here. So... You got us. You need to oil that door, Paul. That's Brad. Brad, you need to oil that door. Oh, sorry, I I was on mute. All right. I um, thought somebody had an elephant in the room with them. That's almost what it sounded like. But hey, I got a question that's on a totally different topic. Sure. Okay. 
Did anybody know what was going on with the uh, HF propagation today? Uh, I'll tell you what my experience was. Uh, mid morning, short skip opened up on 40 meters where I could hear everybody in Ohio, Michigan, and all around, like S9 plus, which is the first time that, no, it's the second time that's happened in two months where that close end skip was actually working. And it was amazing. <laughs> and then later on in the early afternoon, the band went totally dead. I mean, totally dead. My noise level went way down. The, uh, there was no signal anywhere on my, uh, and I even tuned up and down the band. It was just totally dead. And then it gradually came back. And uh, I was one of the few signals that, that there's a, there's a, a net up in uh, in Ontario, and that was one of the few signals that they could actually hear good. I, I was getting a five nine up up there, but uh, the, the the guy that runs that net kept think, talking about a, a solar flare, but I don't think there was any solar flares that, that's been advertised on the solar news. So a uh, couple friends of mine. Weird. A couple of friends of mine had posted on 100 Watts Noir on Facebook. They said, what's going on? They were on 17, and apparently similar things happened. It's like things got crazy, then all of a sudden just went, Phew, yeah, and slowly came back. It's when, when, when ground wave does weird stuff, it's freaky. I was, when, oh, it was last, uh, last Christmas when I was working the 12 Days of Christmas event, um, all of a sudden, I started working guys on 40 up on the northwest side of Chicago, S9. That's unusual. <laughs> that should not happen. Yeah, um, but that's because because the guy, you know, came back, he said it was nine. I said, oh, where are you? And he, he said, like, you know, Bowling Brook. And I'm like, what? <laughs> that's not I, supposed to happen. There's a guy in town I can work. He, he's I can't think of his uh <laughs> call sign right now but he's he's mobile only and he works for the university and he and i were both on the uh on the nickel belt that's that ontario net one day and i could hear him so i contacted him and we had quite a long talk and he lives he's four miles south of me yeah joe is showing some propagation stuff i'm gonna highlight him again that was that was unusual because dale who lives down there just south of town off of highway two uh i can hear him calling the nets and we've we've talked but it's pretty low signal that's about nine miles or something like that maybe less that's a weird spike yeah that's your solar flare right there yeah so it must I mean, have it been wasn't there was no maybe. prediction of a solar flare that I could find anywhere. M class. Yeah, right here. Go to solarham.com. Okay. This is the best site on the net for looking at solar situation. But a few years ago I was on the our repeater and somebody came in there were in the upper upper west corner of Ohio and we talked for a while. Wow. Oh, yeah. I was, leaving, I was leaving the hospital one night and went to key back up to talk to radio to tell him that I was clear and available. And a police dispatcher in Wisconsin answered me and said, I don't know that you're one of our units. <laughs> I, I, uh, back about you know, maybe eight years ago, nine years ago, um, with just the copper J pole I had, um, mounted like 18 inches off the ground inside my courtyard, I was able to hit a repeater in Milwaukee on a reasonably constant basis. Um, that went away. And now I've got that comet vertical up 15 feet. And I, I still, I can't, sometimes I have trouble hitting Chicago. Yeah, you need an N9 TAX. <laughs> and a big tree. Do any of you guys remember the old Russian woodpecker? Yep. <laughs> there's still some weird stuff out there. There's uh, yeah. There's there's some. Wait a minute, you got to explain that one. 
Russian woodpecker. Over, it's over the horizon, <laughs> over the horizon the radar. Band. Yeah, it's guess, uh, yeah. it's over the horizon radar from Russia. Um, it's just a, uh, and it sounded like like a woodpecker. It's like, yeah. and it would just, it was broadband, and it would come and go. And right. once once it came on the band you were on, that that segment of the band is done. Yeah. Um, they finally shut it down, but occasionally something like that still comes up that you can't really tell where it's from. But if you look up, somebody's probably got audio samples from it. But uh, when they kick that thing on, I can't imagine how much power was on the other end pushing that signal out. Yeah, you but it just, it just wiped out HF. Yeah. Kind of so like signal wiki has that signal on there. So you can hear it. Yeah. Yeah. You can kind of like, uh, Kind of like uh, Spark Gap Skellington that used to live across the street from me. Um, I don't know if I've told this story before. One night I'm sitting down here and I'm I'm tuning across. All of a sudden, everything from 160 on up to 10 is just kind of obliterated by this repeating, repeating um, static pattern. And I could not. I'm starting to turn stuff off in the house, trying to figure out what it is. And I, I don't get anything. So I, I took a video of the front of the radio with it playing so I could share it with some friends. Said, Do you know what this is? And and I, I had to go out to get some groceries. So I, it was dark. I got in the car. I look, uh, you know, look out, out the back um, in the mirrors trying you know, so I can back out the driveway. And I see this giant 15 foot high Jack inflatable Jack Skellington character balloon. Huh? Uh, across the street and two houses down from me and it's got a flashing light pattern and suddenly my brain clicked in i said that flashing pattern is familiar so i brought up my phone and i brought up that video and i timed it and i played it and sure enough it's the cheap flasher circuit inside that balloon lighting up a string of 15 foot high string of leds that's putting out broadband rf and uh and uh, I, I went over and I talked to the guy and he didn't care. And I said, can I try to put some ferrite chokes on the power to see if that, that did nothing. It's the end, the 15 feet of wire to the LEDs inside the balloon. That was an antenna. And I explained to him, I said, this thing is wiping out everybody's radio on this block as long as you have it on. And he's like, yeah, whatever. And so <laughs> he, he lived there, his, his, for Halloween, from I would say the beginning of October, pretty much all the way to Thanksgiving, his yard was just full of Halloween crap in this giant fifteen foot spark gap Did transmitter. You have a pellet rifle? That was a thought, but he would already had met me, so that would make me prime suspect number one. <laughs> but uh, no, that thing that thing wiped out our HF for two months every year until he finally packed up and moved. Hey, Paul. Oh, yeah. Just remember something. Yes. Cheap Chinese things like that tend to catch fire. Good point. <laughs> just on their own. Just maybe. I'm yeah. sorry that happened, sir. <clears throat> if you want to hear some irony, what messes up my radio is the wall wart for my Baofeng cheapo radio. <laughs> uh. Ser seriously, I plug in that wall wart and my, my HF goes nuts. That's not good. You guys um, want to hear the woodpecker? Yes. Let me see if this works. That's, that's it, but louder. Turn it up a little louder. That's just what it sounded like, but it's a lot louder. Can you turn it up, Joe? Yeah. Uh, it's not near loud enough yet. <laughs> Hang on, let me see if I can do it. Uh, 
Okay, so the, this was an early warning radar detec detection system for anti-ballistic missiles. Yep. Interesting. Okay, so is there a search feature on? Oh, here it is. Russian would. Becker, let's see if Signal Wiki knows it by that. I probably okay. should turn, turn the mic towards the speakers. See if you hear that. It starts off good, but it dies. Muting it? Yeah. Technology is just too smart for us nowadays. Well, the low, the low sound is what it sounded like. like that it was a lot louder. Okay, hang on. I think your system's attenuating the volume. I can do. I can do this. Hang on. Uh, yeah, you think you can. Share screen. I'm enjoying it, anyways. <laughs> Don't hear anything, Paul. Well, wait. Did it not come through? No. Oh, you know what? Hang on. Yeah, Mr. Smarty Pants here forgot to check the sound button. That, that's it. And that right there was killing uh, wwv that was it and that was a uh, that photo was a photo of one of the antenna arrays they were using to broadcast that so that was like from the 70s and through the 80s i don't know when they finally stopped that but yeah. man Long when that time. came on you're done turn the radio off go get yep. dinner yep very annoying my, my favorite part of this this Wikipedia article is the uh, amateur radio operators formed the Russian Woodpecker Hunting Club. And they, <laughs> attempted, they attempted to jam the signal by transmitting synchronized, unmodulated, continuous wave signals at the same pulse rate as the offending signal. Yeah. yeah it was, and for a long time, um, nobody knew what it was because it was like yeah. top secret Russian stuff and, and nobody. Nobody could figure out what it was. I mean, the government probably knew, but they weren't saying anything either because it was all espionage stuff. The so, hands all called it the Russian woodpecker. Yep. <laughs> there are some now that are uh, called number stations, which are just, uh, um, they just broadcast a series of numbers and they're not sure. Um, it's It's all some sort of code and some spy thing but it they like get really loud too in some places i've heard about those like yeah some spies out in the uh doing clandestine things and they're yeah and the, the numbers that they're transmitting mean nothing except to the people who are hearing them i've heard number stations yeah yeah they are real yeah i've heard them too what uh what band do you tip typically find them on well, you find them in between the hand bands, right? So wherever the in the shortwave areas, you know, like nine or five megahertz areas. Good boy, we're thirteen hours away from the rocket lander on Earth. Oh boy, Matt, oh, the, Matt's uh, tracking the rocket here. We got the, thirteen hours until Armageddon. The Chinese one that's that's totally out of control. Uh -huh. Yeah, <laughs> where your heart? They're hoping that most of it burns up on the way in, and it's only small chunks that hit the Earth, not. Not the like ten story high building piece. Well, listen, I was listening to news earlier. I heard talking about this, and I guess like back before we knew how to do space really well, like all of ours did that too. Well, Skylab deorbited, yeah. but but it no, mostly no, 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 burned no. up, and it I think what the bigger chunks hit the ocean. Early on, when we were playing around, we, yeah, there was a number of big things like the size of a bus that came back into the atmosphere. But after the thing, rocket launch but the thing is theoretically now we know better 
<laughs> we do so, yeah but chinese you know they're just they're just getting their space program going you that's know? right gonna... they're just kind of new to this thing so yeah um give them some credit give them some uh we did a story a... we did a story on a uh a mystery radio transmission in in uh dc um it was a, a traffic beacon that was um left over from the first um obama inauguration where it was telling people you know traffic is you know reroute and take this and that it was an automated thing that was playing and somebody forgot to go shut the trailer down and go get it and it was it was somewhere and for like 10 years this thing it must have been solar powered was just broadcasting this signal telling people you know on whatever date it was it says go here and so finally, somebody, I guess, got a hold of the right people who looked it up on a map and said, oh, and all of a sudden it just went off the air. Mm. Um, you know, want to listen to, to other stuff. I mean, you've got a scanner. The, the problem with a lot of the, uh, the, the police radios and stuff now are encrypted or uh, digital. So it's, you can't hear as much, uh, aircraft though, are still AM, uh, and they are AM for a number of, uh, really good reasons. Um, FM has the capture effect where the stronger signal will take over the receiver and a weaker signal will not get in. So if a plane is in distress, they won't hear it. If another plane is already talking to the tower so that's why you've got am still uh for aircraft radio because you know you can you can hear another station in there another plane in there if there's a problem also well, inexpensive scanners don't work to listen to the new state system because they right. can't decode the simulcast exactly i mean i've got this i've got this really nice Bearcat that's a, a little bit older that I used to be able to hear stuff on and now it's I can I can hear trains and uh, aircraft and, and occasional fire calls but now it's a bone anchor Paul it kind of is fortunately it was a gift so um oh uh that uh, that aircraft uh don't remember now exactly which airline the one a couple years ago that uh, disappeared and uh, crashed in the ocean, and they have never found it. Yeah. H three seventy. Yeah, um, they recently got some help from some hams who were looking at whisper logs uh, for whisper stations in that area, and they know what the normal pattern of reception is for that area. And on the time window when the plane would have been passing through that area. They saw disruptions in the reception of the now whisper is a, uh, a system where a bunch of people around the world have really low power transmitters. It's mostly for propagation checking and for like antenna testing, but it just, it sends out a regular digital beacon and other stations will hear it and they'll report back to a, to a network and you can look online. And if you build yourself a little whisper transmitter and uh, you turn it on, you can, you know, get a couple hours later, you can go to this website and you can look and see where your signal has been heard. And um, the number of hams were looking at the logs for that time frame for that area. And they saw a disruption in the pattern. So they've uh, been working with authorities to hopefully narrow down the search field where that plane might have gone down because so far all they've ever found was miscellaneous debris that floated up on on shores somewhere um but they're hoping maybe that will help them you know the the information they got from the hams will help them actually find the wreckage so all right if anybody has anything else otherwise yeah, they're getting um, cheap on credit cards and ATM cards now, too. Hmm? They're getting cheap on credit cards and ATM cards. They're not embossing the numbers on them anymore. No, because nobody is nobody is using one of the the machines that runs it through a, the paper. 
Sometimes I still have to. I have not been to a place that uses an, an, an embossing machine. Oh, they yep. read them. In like 10 years. I don't even know if that's on legit it. anymore. Well, no. no the, so credit card comp if it's fraud, credit card companies won't cover it if you read a carbon copy of it. Yeah. No, the, the cards still have chips. Yeah, um, they read the chip. That's what they read. Yeah, some of them don't have. Uh, yeah, but when they're some systems of them, down, they still use the embosser. Well, they I haven't seen one in years. Wow. Well, I've seen one three years ago. They really need to get with the program then. <laughs> so the system went down and people still wanted to buy stuff. Oh, well, yeah. No, the, the company then, stopped embossing. Number one, it's cheaper to make the cards without having to pay for that tooling. And uh, yeah, there's probably two people in the country that still use an embosser. Pretty much. Yeah. Metro's one of them when their system was down. Hmm. I don't know. I find that hard to believe. I went to Speedway one time and their computer was down. They wouldn't take cash. <laughs> what? No, I'm serious. I told the lady, I'm like, well, look, I had a pop and a candy bar or something. And I'm like, look, the pop's like $1.99 and the candy bar is like a buck. I said, here's five. I know that's enough money. Just take the five. And she's like, I can't. I can't sell it. My system's down. And I'm like, look, write down on a piece of paper what I got. And when the system comes back up, put it in the system and use the money. And I said, then, then you can keep the change. And you, she should open, it. you should open the pop and drink it and took a bite out of the candy bar. Oh, you're probably right. But she wouldn't take it. I had to leave it there on a the counter and leave. They could not, they could not do the transaction. Oh my the goodness. computer was down. So if you found somewhere that's still embossing credit cards, that's a miracle. Well, they were. Anywhere I go, they can't even take cash if their computer's down. Yeah. Now that little receiver is interesting. Which one? Dave uh, put a link in the chat. What kind of receiver? Uh, digital uh, P25 digital police receiver and it, it will recreate it will do unencrypted stuff so if they're encrypting then you're still out of luck it's my understanding that it will do encrypting i'm gonna have to get more information on this i'm gonna try to get him on here uh at the next meeting to talk about it he's currently out of stock you can, you can use uh that what was that stuff that um chris did it you guys yeah. did a DMA, Chris. Yeah, it was uh, if you use an SDR uh, receiver and you do OP25 for the software. OP25, that's what it was, yeah. Yeah, it works really well. I, I have it programmed. I have a Raspberry Pi that runs it. Uh, I sit and I listen to all the Porter County stuff. It works great. If it's encrypted, you're out of luck. You'll never get the encryption key. Right. Um, that's just how it is. But generally speaking, most of the fire, most of the police traffic is unencrypted uh the tactical channels for police tend to be encrypted because for a good reason yeah something's going on and they don't want you to know about it <laughs> unless you're in laporte county yeah. Where, yeah. They, where they think everything is critical yeah there are <laughs> some entities that believe that they're very special and they they need to encrypt everything um, some some municipalities have gone to encryption have found that all of a sudden, the uh, the community input that they got back from all those people listening to the police traffic dropped off, <laughs> and they didn't have that support and help anymore, and so they decided to back out and go unencrypted. Um, but yeah, every every location is different. Yeah. Well, I'm about to build. I've I've got a uh, I've got a little subcompact Windows machine I just got from work that was just retired that. Uh, I'm going to put over here on the bench just for, I've got an SDR play and I've also got the, uh, the little thumb DV, which is for D star. Um, so I'm just going to dedicate that machine to those two things and satellite tracking software. Very cool. Yeah. Question about thumb DV. Hmm? Question about the thumb DV. 
I'll answer what I can. Yeah, I knew you had one. I was going to ask. I was just thinking about asking you. Uh, I've had one for a while now. I bought it a long time ago. And uh, then Kevin got uh, D Star for a while, which didn't last very long. So I didn't play, play with it. But now I decided I ought to just download the Blue DV software and, and try it out. And Blue DV went off. It's no longer available at all. No, it it so is because I, I just I just last month I just downloaded it. Well, this has been a couple of weeks ago. I looked for it, and every time I looked for it, I I got a dead end. Okay, hang on. Uh, Blue DV. Let's look that up. Uh, Blue DV Windows, David PA7 LAM. No, he still got it. Here, let me put it in chat. Well, it's no problem. As long as he's got it, I can find it. But they're there for, for a while. I, I mean, I kept checking back, checking back. And, it, and every time I went to the go to the link where they downloaded, it went to a dead end. Uh, he's he's Dutch. It's uh, you can download the latest version here. Let's go there. Nope, it's there. Okay, good. So, yeah. So if you look it up, he's he's Dutch. It's p a seven l i m dot n l. Yeah, I know what it is. I've I've been on his website. Yeah. So maybe it was just maybe it's just a temporary glitch, but it's there. It um, I've be. I've also used it on a Mac with a uh, uh, software called Buster. <laughs> And it works fine. I've got a uh, Logitech gaming headset that I use when I when I want to play D Star on that until I can figure out how to get my hotspot working right. Is that a USB headset or a plug-in? USB. Yeah. Okay. I wasn't sure. I don't have one on my uh, computer. I have to get one, but uh, yeah, they're cheap. But I've used it a number of times to get on on a. D star reflector and, and talk to people when I can't do it on the radio. Yeah, I used to do it on the radio. I used to talk to a truck driver, but he was lived down uh, west of Indianapolis, and uh, I'd pick him up on. Uh, I'd hear him down in uh, Alabama, and the next, you know, a week later, I'd hear him in New York, and he was all over the country. Yeah, he was, he was running his. Uh, D, he had a regular D star radio, a, a laptop and his uh, cell phone. And that's how he got on D-Star. I'm not sure how that all hooked together, but that's how he did it. Um, I found out too, I believe, if, if you want to play with the uh, Brandmeister on DMR and you have a DMR radio that will do VHF, I believe the Gary repeater is on Brandmeister. So I'm going to try to the the uh, the thumb DV will do Grandmeister and uh, yeah I would think so because it it's I mean it's it's just the AMB three thousand chip so one other I don't know if it's the P twenty five or what's the other one the uh, Yesu thing uh, Fusion Fusion I Fusion know, I think is a different animal but it, I I could be it, wrong maybe it is I think it's the maybe it's the P twenty five yeah but uh different kodak yeah so i'm gonna i'm gonna try to program my my 800d for the gary repeater and see if that works because pretty much everybody i want to talk to on dmr is on brandmeister well, so the thumb dv works doesn't that work on brandmeister i haven't tried it for anything but d star yet oh, oh I, i'm sorry yeah D, yeah dmr yeah but i think it does because what i was it reading could. On on a Blue DV website, I was reading. I thought it was set up. For, it, it it would do. Uh, yeah, the, the uh, Blue DV software will do DMR. DS oh, I take that back. Blue DV will also do Fusion. Really? Wow. So Blue DV will do Fusion, D Star, and DMR with the Thumb DV. Don't they have fusion over in the Plymouth area? The club over there have a fusion? Michigan City is is a fusion. So is uh, Stark or 
Couts or Knox, I mean. They have a few Henry Peter also. Really? Wow. Are you guys going to bring any to field day? Well, Are we bringing a field day? Any of this digital stuff? I've never seen it. I could. Yeah. Um, the, the, the thing we're talking about right now is for uh, internet only, uh, getting to these networks. But I mean, it, it, you can do them with radios. But I mean, I can bring this to show um, because, you know, and, and this is, these are really popular with like guys that travel a lot who want to stay connected um, because you, you check into the hotel room, you plug this into your laptop, get on the, on the internet, and then you can connect into the D star network or DMAR, or you can talk to people you're used to talking to if you don't have a repeater in that area. So yeah. yeah. When, when Kevin had the D star for a short period of time, yeah, that uh, that multi-mode um, controller on that that other repeater is it it doesn't get any uh, any attention. So I would need to talk about making but he, that. D, D Star only worked for a short period of time, and I used to get on the worldwide D Star uh, reflector, and uh, I talked to people in Tokyo or Ireland or all over the place. It was kind of fun just to play around with it. Yeah, yeah, I've been on I've been on uh, DMR here on uh, there's not as much activity on the the Seabridge network as there is on Brandmeister but uh before I got the actual the the second CS800 for the house um I just used my little Titera 380 into an external antenna and I was talking to some guy in England on a handheld from my basement which was kind of cool. Yeah. I mean, I know there are people who say that, you know, if there's any sort of internet connection involved, it's not real radio. It's like, go away. It's just just a different thing. If you don't like it, then don't play with it. Yeah. You have common interests and uh, it's interesting to talk to people on the other side of the world. And uh, it is. It's a lot easier than uh, 40 meters and, uh, <laughs> you know, or 20 meters. <laughs> Without, without a beam. Um, and John, is there a way to download the chat? I do not believe there is. Copy Aside, well, here, here's, here's the problem. And it's, it's on me. Well, not really on me, but because my Zoom account is tied in through the hospital side of the University of Chicago for HIPAA regulations, they have disabled copy and paste. Oh, wow. So if there's a link, you can click on the link now and it'll open up a browser page and then you can bookmark that. Um, but it doesn't allow copy and paste from the text in the chat. Wow. And that's, that's because, because my account is, I mean, I, I don't work for the hospital, but my account, the department I work for is related to the hospital. So most of our accounts are tied to them. And for HIPAA, they don't allow copy and paste, hey, which we have learned in our meetings is sometimes a pain in the butt. Hey, Paul. <laughs> yeah. Does NetLogger have a chat? I don't know. We got to look into that because we could run a NetLogger alongside with this yeah. and do our chat. And do, in the, there. do the chat in there. Yeah, it's got almost instant messaging. Yeah, they have a. Uh... Yeah, okay. they have it. They have it, but it's it's a little time delay there. It takes a, a while. Well, let's we'll look we'll look into that in, in time for the next one. Um. So yeah. So I'll, I'll leave this up for a little bit. If there's anybody with links in here that you're interested in, just click on them real quick and get those get those pages opened, and and uh, then you can bookmark them from there. Uh, one one last question on field day. Are we going to have a, a meeting prior to field day? One last Zoom to kind of get everyone well, on the same page? I mean, we do have a meeting before field maybe day. Maybe that's we? what we should plan on for the June regular meeting is getting, you know, hammered down food and everything else. Yeah. I mean, we can do a second quicker meeting because it's it's the end of June, right? It's like the 20-something. 26th. 26th. 
Yeah. So I mean, we, 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 we have the June meeting. Yeah. So we can hammer down the 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 primary details and the food and all that for our our first meeting in June on the regular first Friday, and then we can do another quick one in for just for those people who are going to come to field day, we can do another one um, like the week before field day, just for final details. Sounds good. That, that'd yeah. be fine. I, I can set that up. Yeah, that'd be good. Kind of, kind of coordinate. Coordinate. Yep. Testing, check, check, check. Yep, you're there. Please check, check. I have one last question. Sure. Who's got the better radio, Tavis or Christian? <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a great question. Uh, this seems like every radio that comes into this house ends up being Tav's radio. <laughs> so. Any tone eight seven eight repeater behind me. Uh, if I can get to it, I know hard to get at uh xpr 6580 that's sitting on the charger it's my 900 megahertz radio um there's a case over here with a 7300 because we're going to the smoky mountains on sunday and we thought why not operate radio yeah absolutely oh you, you got a 900 megahertz radio yeah i have one over on the rack here uh, so 440 repeater um, 900 megahertz Kenwood um, Radio Shack scanner. Um, this is a two meter radio from our local fire department that's not really on. And then again, XPR 6580. Do, do you guys share the same ham shack or does he, Travis have his own? <laughs> yeah, he, he kind of has his own in a way. <laughs> <laughs> well, it looks like they keep Christian in the closet. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much how it goes. So yeah, we're we're off to a little vacation in the in the Smoky Mountains here coming up, and we're gonna take our radio gear with us, and and we're gonna see what kind of contacts we can make. Cool. So Have a great. good time. Battery yeah. box as well. Cool. You know, and and for those of you who are new, um, you know the the the, the Baofeng radios from from a lot of people get a lot of crap but um you know it's it's a good starting radio it's it's a it's a, an affordable way to get in and play with two meters and 440 to learn they're not the best radios um but you know like i i've got one here that um uh, one time amazon had them on sale for 25 bucks and, and for an extra $10, I got the extended battery. And for like an extra $5, I got the, uh, the extended yeah. antenna. So the thing is, <coughs> if I'm going somewhere where I'm, I'm not sure, and, uh, you know, if, if I drop this and it breaks, I've broken a $25 radio versus the $500 Kenwood HT. So they have their place. And, uh, you know, for, for, for beginner to, to try to get in and, and, you know, without putting a huge amount of money in, um, it's, it's a way to get started and you can program them with chirp, which is free programming software. So, but, uh, you know, I mean, I've got, I've got a set because I'm the sound director for Chicago street theater. And every year we do that Shakespeare in the park thing down in the, the, the park, the main city park in Valpo. And the theater is two and a half blocks away. And there are times in between that I need to talk to the people getting ready at the theater to come over to the park. So I got, I looked on uh, Amazon and I've got a, the, the little Baofeng 888s, which are like GMRS radios. Um, five watts, like eight channels. I got a pack of 10 for a hundred dollars. So my thinking is, I've got a lot of people who aren't used to using radios. If somebody walks and, and on the way over here drops and it gets kicked or run over by a car, I've lost a $10 radio and I'm not that worried about it. You're not using GMRS, are you? No. You say you have to have a license for that. I know. We're working on that. So, 
All right, everybody, if we're all good, um, thank you. This has been fun. And if I come up with something interesting uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll do another one of these. Otherwise, I will see everybody for the June meeting. We'll talk about the, the, big, the big details planning for field day, and then we'll have a follow-up in a couple of weeks before the event. And I think we will have fun. Oh, we're going to have a great time. Can't wait. Yeah. And uh, thanks again to Joe for the presentation. Everybody go to his YouTube channel, subscribe and watch and share, yeah, it, share it with your friends too. Let's, let's get him some attention. Attaboy Joe. And yeah. also if, uh, if you're, if you're on, if you're on Facebook, the hundred Watts and a wire group is uh, I'm, I'm a member of that. That's also very good um, mentoring for if you a lot of questions a lot of experience on there and we also don't tolerate jerks so there is there's no you're going to ask a question there's no chance that somebody is going to get on you and, and make fun of you because we don't let that happen and uh the 100 watts and a wire youtube channel the the podcast has moved to a video thing now and every saturday morning at 10 o'clock is when that's on and i and my editor from Amateur Radio Newsline are uh, a part of that. We're usually on around quarter after, 20 after. So if you want to watch that, go ahead. And then, of course, always Amateur Radio Newsline uh, comes out every uh, late Thursday night, every Friday morning. We've been doing that since 1977. It's a 20-minute audio amateur radio newscast. And uh, if you happen to listen to this week, you'll probably recognize the voice of the guy who's doing the anchoring. So really, yeah, you might recognize him. So, all right, everybody, have a good weekend. Seven hey, three, everybody. Seven three. Bye -bye. Good, good night. Good seeing everybody. Thanks, Joe. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Paul. Bye bye. Thanks, bye. guys.